So good evening, everyone, and welcome uh, to Searle's fourth book talk of the academic year. My name is Chris Welsh. I'm the executive director of the Center for Ethics and Rule of Law. And I see a lot of familiar faces out here. Um, our book talk series continues to grow in popularity, and we continue to bring to Penn Law distinguished guests like we have in the past and like we are very grateful to have here today uh, in Director Clapper. Um, before I formally introduce our moderator, Searle's founder and faculty director, Professor Claire Finkelstein, I just want to take a brief minute to talk to you. And as again, you've seen, I see many familiar faces, so you've heard this before probably, but about what the center is, what our mission is, what we do, and how we actually do it. So we're a nonpartisan interdisciplinary institute dedicated to preserving and promoting ethics and the rule of law in national security, democratic governance, conflict, and war. So what does that mean? How do we actually do those things? Well, first, we educate the public. We hold events like this, where we bring in distinguished national security leaders like Director Clapper and bring you here to campus to talk about the most pressing issues that are confronting our country and national security today. Second, we educate students. So we engage students in a variety of our programs throughout the year, but one of the things that we, that we do really well is that we run a summer internship program. So if you know any students who are looking for a summer internship position, the deadline for applying is tomorrow, but it's a great program. Uh, we, we bring in people uh, every Wednesday and every Friday, leaders in national security to engage with our students and to instill those ethics and rule of law values in our next generation of national security leaders. Third, we advance academic thought. Uh, Professor Finkelstein is the co-editor of our Oxford University press series, Ethics, National Security, and the Rule of Law. So if you would like to have any, look at any of those volumes, um, really are cutting edge academic uh, volumes on issues that are pressing for national security. And fourth, influence public policy. So we, we publish a variety of policy papers, and we've also just recently um, partnered with the Annenberg Public Policy Center here on Penn's campus to really increase our uh, influential, uh, our influence on policy. So if you're interested in learning more about the center, there's a reception after the book talk. Reach out to me, reach out to Claire, reach out to our director of engagement, Eileen Kenny, because uh, we're always interested in having more people involved in the work that we're doing. So now our moderator, our founder, Professor Claire Finkelstein. As uh, Dean Ruger said, she's the Algernon Biddle Professor of Law and Philosophy here at the University of Pennsylvania Cary Law School. In 2019, she was named a senior fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute, uh, expert in law of armed conflict and military ethics and national security. She's the co-editor of our Oxford University Press Series. And in 2012, she founded this center. So again, Thank you all for coming. Thank you to Director Clapper for being here. And we hope to engage you all in a very thoughtful um, book talk today. Thank you. Claire. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dean Ruger, uh, Chris, our executive director, but most especially uh, to Director Clapper for being with us today. Uh, we have, as Director Clapper, um, said uh, as we were running him ragged all day, uh, you know, you should work us hard. Uh, but uh, given how hard he has worked uh, for the country for so many years, we were eager to have his expertise. Um, Lieutenant General Clapper served as the Director of National Intelligence from 2010 to 2017. In that position, he led the United States intelligence community and served as the principal intelligence advisor to President Obama. Prior to serving as the Director of National Intelligence, uh, Lieutenant General Clapper served in two administrations as the Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, where he was the Principal Staff Assistant and Advisor to the Secretary and Deputy Secretary of Defense on Intelligence, Counterintelligence, and Security Matters for the Department. In this capacity, he was also dual-hatted as the Director of Defense Intelligence for DNI. Uh, Director Clapper began his military career as a rifleman in the U.S. Marine Corps, served two combat tours during Vietnam, and flew 73 combat support missions in EC-47s over Laos and Cambodia. He was Assistant Chief of Staff for Intelligence at U.S. Air Force Headquarters during Operations Desert Shield, Desert Storm, and Director of Intelligence for three war fighting commands, U.S. Forces Korea, Pacific Command, and Strategic Air Command. 
He has numerous awards, including the National Intelligence Distinguished Service Medals, two Defense Distinguished Service Medals, the Air Force Distinguished Service Medal, the Coast Guard's Distinguished Public Service Award, and the Department of Defense Distinguished Civilian Service Award. He has also received the NAACP's National Distinguished Service Award and the Presidentially Conferred National Security Medal. So please join me in welcoming Director Clapper. So we're here today to talk about Director Clapper's book, Facts and Fears. He has been making the book tours, and I'm so glad he had uh, time on his... No, it's on paperback now, so it's cheaper. It's also out in paperback. Uh, we will be selling copies of it afterwards. But um, for those of you who have not read the book, I highly recommend it. It is a fascinating tour, beautifully written book, and, and just incredibly interesting, the number of different issues in his long service in national security that he covers. Uh, so... Uh, it's a little hackneyed, but I'd love to start at the very beginning, uh, and, and we won't go through every chapter systematically, but one of the things that I found most poignant was your description of your early life, uh, moving from place to place, and really the sort of harrowing experiences uh, that you had uh, towards the end of the war. And I wonder if you could just describe how you think that uh, complex early life fashioned your interest in national security? Well, I should explain. Uh, thanks, Claire, for the very gracious in, uh, introduction. I, I should explain <clears throat> that uh, my dad was uh, in the Army for 28 years in uh, signal intelligence, uh, and uh, got, which he got involved in towards the end of World War II, which is the uh, collection and interception of uh, foreign messages and you know, uh, morphing them into useful intelligence. And he, he got into this and just really was captured by it. So at the end of the war, while everybody else is demobilizing, he stayed in, in the Army, which shrunk uh, dramatically. And so uh, I embarked on uh, uh, a lot of traveling and moving around in the course of uh, my life. Um, <clears throat> and I uh, had the honor recently of being commencement speaker at my alma mater, University of Maryland. And I had occasion to tell the students uh, in, in the, graduate, the graduates that uh, if their parents were still alive, give them a hug, no matter what the relationship was, because writing this book was an opportunity to be contemplative and it was also a cathartic. But I realized full well that the huge impact my parents had on me in my life, uh, unfortunately, long after they had gone. So there's a particular vignette I thought I'd share with you since it involves Philadelphia. Hmm. And I guess I'd call it when I first knew I was going to be an intelligence officer. Hmm. This is uh, 1953, and my dad was number two in a small U.S. Army signal intelligence unit in northern Japan, Hokkaido, Japan. And we were on our way from Hokkaido, Japan to Fort Devens, Massachusetts. <clears throat> so the custom in our family, as was the case, as is the case in many military families, that my parents would park my sister and me and one of the grandparents, go ahead to the next duty station, get set up in quarters or uh, a place off post, and then come back, get, set, get it settled, come back and retrieve us. So that's exactly what we were doing in the summer of 1953. I was 12 years old, you can do the math. And my grandparents lived here in Philadelphia. So my mom and dad dropped uh, my sister and me off and went, I went ahead to Fort Devens. And uh, the big thing of the day, this is 1953, mind you, was television. We didn't have television, U.S. television, uh, in Japan. So I was captured by this huge box in my grandparents' living room with a little bitty screen, black and white. And so uh, I was really fascinated by television. So the first Friday night I was here, um, I was still on Japan time, so I was wide awake, so I stayed up, watched the, I remember it was the Schmidt's Beer Mystery Hour. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the program went off and I said, gee, I wonder what else is on. Well, in those days, you actually had to go up to the television set and turn the dial, you know, none of this remote thing. 
So I went up and turned the dial, and there was only four channels in, in Philadelphia, all black and white. So I'm turning the selector dial, and between channel four and five, I'll never forget this, and I heard talking. No picture, but talking. So I just held the selector dial, but that frequency between channel four and five, and I figured out it was the Philadelphia Police Department dispatcher. <laughs> Well, in those days, in Phil I don't know how it is now, but in those days, there's all kinds of mayhem going on on Friday night. <laughs> so I just listened to this, and pretty soon I, I got tired of standing in there holding it, so I ran out to the kitchen, got some toothpicks, and stuck them in the selector <laughs> dial so it would stick on that, 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 that position. So I guess I hacked my grandparents' TV set. <laughs> so I stayed up till about 3 or 4 in the morning just listening to this. You know, there's all kinds of stuff, go shootings and police chases and bar fights and I don't know what all. So I finally went to bed and the next day I scrounged the map of the city of Philadelphia from my grandfather. And I, so I stayed up Saturday night and, I, and again, that was pretty wild too. So I started plotting the addresses, as many as I could capture on the map. With a, piece, with a pencil. So pretty soon I'm sleeping all day and staying up all night doing this. I just thought it was really cool to figure out what was going on just by listening. So after a while, you know, the police, universally police use 10 codes, 10 4, 10 6, 10 8. So I got a three by five card file and started writing those down and just figuring <laughs> out what they meant just by inferentially what was going on. Then I figured, you know, by plotting where the police calls were going, figured out what the high crime areas were in Philadelphia, and also, inferentially, the police district boundaries. And in those days, the, every police officer and a great lieutenant above had a unique call sign to include the police chief. So I sort of figured out what the criterion was for getting the police chief out of bed. So about two and a half weeks later, my parents come back from Fort Devens. I got a play. They're set up and. They retrieved my sister and me. So my dad, you know, just to make conversation, says to me, so, what have you been doing? <laughs> so I whip out my map, my three by five cards, <laughs> and I gave him about a 20 or 25 minute discourse on the organization and operation of the Philadelphia Police Department, <laughs> how many cruisers they had assigned to each district, what the district <laughs> boundaries were, and uh, uh, all the unique call signs and the 10 codes and all this. I'll, it, you know, 67 years ago or whatever it was, I'll never forget the expression on my dad's face. My God, I raised my own replacement. <laughs> <laughs> now, I like to tell that story because fortunately it's semi-humorous, but also it, it, it makes a point about the nature of intelligence work, notably signal intelligence, mm -hmm. where you're always dealing with incomplete information you develop hypotheses about what's going on just based on what you're listening to. You test the hypotheses and you, over time, produce an assessment. And that's, I didn't know it at the time. And certainly the Philadelphia Police Department wasn't anticipating that some 12 year old kid, nerd kid, was going to listen in on them and figure out what they were doing. So I guess that's, I first knew I was going to be an intelligence officer. So, so uh, one harrowing story that uh, I'll go, just to backtrack a bit, my mother and I were on the first boatload of dependents to go anywhere towards Europe after World War II. We were on a troop ship, and my dad was stationed, this is 1946, was stationed in uh, what's now uh, Asmara, Eritrea. At the time, Eritrea was a province of Ethiopia. You know, talk about a godforsaken place. So we were on a troop ship, and it took us eight weeks altogether to get from Fort Wayne, Indiana, uh, to Asmara, Eritrea. And so we had a troop ship. We went into uh, Leghorn, Italy to pick up 500 Italian war brides. That, you know, women had married uh, U.S. soldiers during the war. And we hit a mine left over from the war in the harbor and uh, blew the rudder off the ship. And I, I, it's very vivid. I was only you know, six years old or something like that. I still remember hauling up on the deck. They lowered the lifeboats. They all had life vests on, and uh, of course, they didn't have any smalls or child size. They were all for soldiers. And uh, anyway, they towed us in, and we were laid up for two weeks there, and uh, got the rudder fixed. And then we headed down to Alexandria, Egypt, and landed there. And my dad bribed a pilot boat captain with a carton of cigarettes, and he got to come out to the ship and meet us. 
So they put us up in the uh, old Shepherd Hotel, which is you know, back from British colonial days. And uh, it was in those that it's since burned down, but it was a two story wooden building. So my parents parked me at the top of the stairs, a kind of a sitting area, bedroom suite sort of thing, as I remember it. And I finally fell asleep. And so there was a little bar area uh, down on the foot of the stairs, which it turns out was frequented by uh, King Farouk. And uh, my mother at the time was blonde, blue-eyed, so it was kind of a novelty. And he, uh, he started hitting on my mother. <laughs> and my dad had a couple drinks, and uh, you know he, he took a swing at the king, which is not a good thing. <laughs> so the next thing I knew was about two o'clock in the morning, and my mother is packing our suitcases. Well, I mean, <laughs> just throwing stuff in there, and we're getting out of Dodge City. So they arranged a flight for us to fly out of Cairo. We were supposed to be there for a week to get a flight to Asmara. So so much for war stories. I'm, I'm sorry. Well, actually, let's let's go to some real war stories, which is I, I want to spend a few minutes about your tour of duty in Vietnam, uh, because um, you were involved in, in some of the most difficult parts of that war, uh, namely Laos and Cambodia. Um, and um, one of the things you recount in your, in your book is what you learned, uh, what you were told during uh, your training, uh, which is you said that um, you were told that while the United States followed the Geneva Conventions on the treatment of prisoners of war, the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong would use much worse techniques on captives than anything we had experienced in training. Uh, decades later, after 9-11, you wrote, I would remember the moral certitude with which our instructors in 1970 stressed that the U.S. would never use those techniques well, except to train our own troops. Can you talk well, a little just, bit about Just to these? clarify a bit. Yeah. I actually I did two tours in Southeast Asia. I went to Vietnam early, 65 and 66, which was by far the most miserable year of my life, both professionally and personally. I almost got out of the Air Force after mm. it was over. I got, became very, very disillusioned with, with the war in general. Yeah. And uh, you know, I briefed General Westmoreland and all this sort of thing, but I just, I just hated it. And uh, almost got out and went to work at the NSA as a civilian. I went back for a second tour in 1970 uh, and I actually was based in Thailand, and I commanded uh, a detachment of about 100 airmen who were signal intelligence uh, specialists, either linguists or uh, manual Morse intercept operators. And uh, the mission was to fly uh, over Laos and a couple times over Cambodia, but mostly Laos, and try to locate enemy Viet, Viet, North Vietnamese Army transmitters, because if you found the transmitter uh, that was associated with a North Vietnamese Army division or regiment, well, presumably you could target them with, with that information. So I was a young captain, about seven years service, and I commanded, I had a hundred, hundred uh, airmen or so uh, under me. In preparation for that, uh, uh, tour, the second tour, I had to go to several training courses, uh, survival training. Basic Air Force survival training, I, it still is, is conducted at Fairchild Air Force Base uh, in Washington State. And part of the training was, the, in the training circumstance, so they emulated uh, torture that the North Vietnamese uh, would, would conduct. And the uh, objective was to give you some sense of some feeling for what that was like. Now, this is obviously in an artificial training environment. So I was exposed, I'll, I'll say, to uh, what became known later as EITs, Extraordinary Interrogation Techniques, uh, all, but, uh, all but waterboarding. And what I learned from that experience, uh, for me, the, the, the tough one was getting put in a box, a little, little bitty box, because I have uh, claustrophobia. So at that point, I would say anything I thought the instructors wanted, wanted me to say. Uh, and I, I, I then learned early on, and, and of course, Claire's right, the instructors would stress that this is not something we do, but we want to familiarize you with what you might encounter if you're shot down uh, over Southeast Asia and you're, you're, ca you're imprisoned by the North Vietnamese. So, um, just from a practical standpoint, quite apart from the moral or ethical uh, considerations and you know whether torture is appropriate, and it isn't, 
just from a practical standpoint, what I observed and experienced later on was, and there's quite a body of literature on this called inducing information from, from uh, people that you're interrogating, is that it's been proven scientifically over and over again that you will get far more information from a someone you're interrogating if you if you develop rapport with them and get them to talk voluntarily. If you go to the root of, of torture, more often than not, you're going to get what they they're going they're going to give you what they think you that you want to hear, which is not is not accurate information. So quite apart from the moral ethical uh, aspects of it. Uh, is just the uh, the practical consideration that uh, you know torture is not always it doesn't work <laughs> ineffective yeah it's ineffective now but one of the things that I was most interested in that was there was a complete acceptance of the idea that we were going to adhere to Geneva Conventions even if our enemy didn't and um, your you spent a lot of time uh, on active duty in the military. Um, before, of course, you became the director of national intelligence. Um, but that ethos in the military must have had a profound effect uh, on everyone who was trained in it. Uh, now, of course, we take the position, and uh, we've officially taken the position uh, in dealing with um, ISIS and dealing with al-Qaeda, that if our enemy doesn't follow Geneva Conventions, we don't have to either. Well. I don't, I don't know that that's, uh, that's a policy, perhaps, of um, uh, the current administration. I, I honestly don't know what's enshrined in, in, in law or regulation in, anymore. What, when I left the government in January 17, the, the standard was the, the Army Field Manual, which has very uh, specific stipulations about how uh, people who are being interrogated are to be treated. And... Uh, the, the military, you know, the best I could observe in my tr many trips to Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, uh, observed those, complied with the, what, what's in the Army Field Manual. Well, the Army Field Manual, of course, is not, it's just that. Uh, so it, it, can, it, it can be rewritten uh, uh, by the Army or by the Department of Defense. But, but right. that, right. for the military at least, is, is currently the standard. I think, I don't think the military on its own would decide that, well, we're, you know, this so and so is not abiding by the Geneva Convention, so we we will we won't either. It was more. I don't a policy, believe the Department of Defense even yeah. even today would would do that. It was more a policy of civilian leadership in uh, post nine eleven, and and part of the justification really for uh, rejecting the Geneva Conventions as applied to non state actors. Is what? As part of the justification that was offered uh, by, for example, the Office of Legal Counsel. Uh, for ignoring the Geneva Conventions in application to Al Qaeda, so that was that was part of well, the argument. Well, I have to, uh, I have to say that uh, I was in the capacity I was in when all this was going on. I was director of the National Geos what's now called the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, and contemporaneously, I had no clue about uh, what was going on with the. Uh, black sites and all that. First I knew about it was when I read about it in the Washington Post in 2005. I right. uh, got involved later on when uh, SDNI when after the lengthy uh, and expensive uh, Senate Intelligence Committee uh, investigation of EITs and uh, I got involved with the White House and the Senate Intelligence Committee on um, generating an unclassified version of the uh, executive summary right. Right. of uh, the um, investigation that it was done by, led by Senator Dianne Feinstein of California. Right. So um, just before we leave the topic of, of Vietnam, and then we'll come to more modern uh, issues, uh, specifically post-9-11 issues, um, it, it occurred to me, uh, reading your discussion of Vietnam, how much Vietnam really was a, a pivot in between sort of the old wars and the, and the, and the new wars that we fight now, a, a little bit of a combination of fighting a state and fighting terrorists. Can you reflect a little bit on, on the impact that you think well, uh, Vietnam the big, had? The big difference is the last time that the United States was involved in a, in a, in a war involving what we thought at the time were mortal enemies, 
That was Germany and Japan, well, World War II. Since then, just every conflict we've gotten involved in has been a, an extension of policy. Yeah. Not necessarily where the U.S. national interest or the U.S. survival was, was threatened as it was in World War II. And to me, that casts a whole different light on a whole different uh, environment or a whole different context, I guess, is what I'm looking for. Uh, to the use of force and, and, the, and the use of our, our military in uh, hostilities where the survival of the United States is not at stake. And that, that to me, is a big difference. Yeah. So, so now, um, you had retired from the military by 1995 right. and thought you were sort of done for the moment. You were going to uh, stay in the private sector and, and eventually retire. Uh, and then suddenly things changed uh, right around the time of 9-11. Could right. you describe a little your decision to go back into public service? Well, I um, retired in 95 and uh, became a contractor, like many people do, and, but working back for the intelligence community and did a lot of things for the... I was on the Cobar Towers uh, investigation with Wayne Downing in 1996 when I really got religion about terrorism. And served on some other board, a uh, commission on weapons of mass destruction, and was on the NSA advisory board. Did a lot of things like that that they have retired people do. And all of a sudden, uh, in the summer of 01, around July, I guess, I got a call from uh, Secretary Rumsfeld's uh, headhunter asking me if I would be willing to come back to government and be director of uh, national, what was then called the National Imagery Mapping Agency. And, um, I said, Sure, my wife was not happy about that, by the way. Uh, for one, it just represented a pretty significant pay cut of what I was doing, and of course I had no, virtually no responsibilities. But anyway, she said okay, and uh, so I did that for almost five years. Started two days after 9-11, very intense time uh, for, uh, uh, for, for the country. And when I got asked, uh, you know, duty guy at heart, and uh, so, uh, you know, the Secretary of Defense asked me, would you take this on? Or, you know, yes or yes or three bags full. And, and then um, I, I sort of had a, you know, I somehow displeased Mr. Rumsfeld, so he canned me uh, <laughs> about three months early when I was supposed to leave in uh, 2006, which I didn't mind. Uh, I was done anyway. And I was uh, out of the government about three months, and then I got a call from uh, Bob Gates, who had become Secretary of Defense, asking me if I'd come back and uh, finish the Bush term as the Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence. So I asked Bob to do me a favor. I said, could you call my wife? <laughs> which he did, and uh, also recounted in his book, which was kind of embarrassing, but anyway. <laughs> So the 19 months turned into three and a half years because first time ever in history where a, um, a Secretary of Defense of one party was asked to stay on by the President of another party. It had never happened before in our history. And President Obama asked Bob to stay on, so he asked me to stay on as, uh, as the Under Secretary. So the 19 months turned into three and a half, three and a half years. And then in April of uh, 10, I think it was, uh, I got a summons up to the SECDEF's office. And uh, we usually had a one-on-one -on -one about every two weeks, and we'd catch up on things. And then I said, okay, uh, I got something else I need to talk to you about. And I said, uh, we need you to do this DNI thing. And I said, no. Uh, <laughs> at the time, I was pushing seven, 70 years old. Now I'm dragging it. <laughs> and I didn't want to, and most importantly, I didn't want to endure another confirmation process because the, uh, uh, the USDI position, our Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, was a Senate confirmable position. It was awful. I got held and all, all kinds of bad stuff. I, so I, I don't want to do this. So uh, I went home that night very proud of myself because I turned down a government job thinking that I would get all kinds of, be, you know, my wife would heap all kinds of praise on me. and what makes women interesting. <laughs> so I tell her about this, and she said, how could you say that? <laughs> what? <laughs> so I wrote a note to uh, Secretary Gates. Uh, next, this was a Thursday. wrote a note on Friday and had it hand-carried up to his office and 
following Tuesday, I was uh, in the Oval Office with my audition interview with President Obama, whom I didn't know. I, he didn't know me, and I, I didn't know him. So, so can you describe for, for the audience, for those who are less familiar, why was ODNI created, and what impact do you think it's had on our intelligence practices? Well, the reason it was created <coughs> as a direct outgrowth, actually, of well, actually two events. Uh, one, of course, most prominently, was 9-11. The 9-11, there was a commission established, <coughs> distinguished uh, formers, uh, was, was co-chaired by Tom Keene, uh, former uh, governor of New Jersey, and Lee Hamilton, who's a congressman from Indiana. And they co-chaired the commission, and they had decided, I think actually the staff probably had this on their agenda anyway, they wanted to create a director of national intelligence. Someone would sit atop this huge global enterprise, the U.S. intelligence community, and lead it, direct it, and ensure, importantly, integration, collaboration, and coordination. So that was the reason they came out with that recommendation. It was also a commission that was appointed on the heels of the infamous national intelligence assessment on weapons of mass destruction in right. Iraq. It was published in October of 2002, which my fingerprints are on. Mm. And that commission also recommended that there needed to be a director of national intelligence who, among other things, could ensure uh, adherence to uh, appropriate tradecraft, uh, analytic tradecraft. So the, the, <coughs> those two commissions led to uh, the enactment on a bipartisan basis and the signing into law by President Bush on this December 17th, uh, 2004, of the Intelligence Reform and Terrorism Prevention Act, IRTPA, which established the position of DNI. The so prior what did it arrangement do? had yeah. been since about 1947 that when the CIA was uh, established, Central Intelligence Agency, that the director of CIA had a second hat as what was called the director of Central Intelligence, where he would preside, he or she would preside over the entirety of the intelligence community. My own experience with about 20 years' worth of up-close and personal observation of DCIs, also directors of CIA, that it's very difficult to uh, oversee the entirety of the community while you're also running an agency. <coughs> I, I did two agencies myself, DIA and NGA, for a total of almost nine years, and, and both those jobs were with you know, thousands of people spread all over the globe are all consuming seven by 24, 365 jobs. So it's pretty hard for uh, hu any human being, no matter how capable, to also run the intelligence community, kind of like uh, part-time help at the post office at Christmas time. And that's kind of the way it was. So anyway, the result of those two commissions was, was establish somebody that didn't have an agency but would oversee the entirety of the community. There were other changes, by the way. The establishment of Department of Homeland Security, the inclusion of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI, as a part of the intelligence community. And, of course, there were some controversial laws passed, notably uh, the USA Freedom Act, passed in the, in the heat of the aftermath of 9-11, of, uh, uh, of which, of course, had uh, some created some civil liberties and privacy uh, controversy, still, still prevails today. Can you say, so, just uh, before you uh, leave that topic, can you say a few things about your view of that act and whether or not at the time you were in favor of it? Oh, well, at the time, um, I was, no, I was actually in favor of, in fact, that's what got, one of the things got me in trouble with Mr. Rumsfeld, uh, uh -huh. was um, in, in the run-up to the law, uh, General Mike Hayden and I were kind of ex officio advisors to the authors of the bill, who was Senator Susan Collins, still in the Senate from Maine, and Senator Joe Lieberman from uh, Connecticut, I think. They were the co-authors of the bill. So Mike and I did a lot of sub rosa consulting with the two of them about uh, what they were trying to do in the bill. And, and Mike and I were both advocates of having a director of national intelligence. Um, and this is but particularly sensitive to Mr. Rumsfeld since uh, we were basically advocating that since four of the intelligence agencies are embedded in DOD that uh, maybe it's time to take, particularly the agencies whose first letter is N, 
<laughs> as a national, ought to be out of DOD. Well, for understandable reasons, Mr. Rumsfeld didn't like that. But anyway, I, I was I was a supporter of the of the of the act. And and so the idea was um, that ODNI would help coordinate intelligence, but also that it would create greater independence from DOD for for uh, the intelligence community. Is that correct? well? The art form here is that of the 16 components of the intelligence community, all but one of them are in somebody's cabinet department, right. the DOD or Department of Energy or Department of State, Department of Treasury, Department of Homeland Security, all have intelligence components, but sort of work for the uh, Director of National Intelligence. So that's a, it's a different, it's a, it's a tricky art form to make that work. But it, but it, but it does. The one component that's not in anybody's cabinet department was it was in his CIA. Right. So those sixteen components plus the office of the director of national intelligence, which is the management staff for, for all this, uh, oversees what is a huge enterprise. You know, two hundred twenty-five thousand people, and the latest budget request is around eighty billion dollars. So it's not trivial. It's larger than all but about three of the cabinet departments, even though it's not organized as a formal cabinet department. Although the director of national intelligence is a cabinet level official. So let's come now to, to some of the controversies that have surrounded particularly uh, the Patriot Act um, intelligence programs and right. the 215 metadata program, uh, which was extremely controversial right. when it emerged. Um, and, and uh, you've had a uh, sort of long and painful experience with, with that. Can you talk a little bit, first of all, um, explain what metadata is and, and what you regard as the uh, utility efficacy of, of that program uh, or lack thereof? So <clears throat> the USA Patriot Act was enacted, I think, in 2002 in, in, the, in actually the heated aftermath of, of the attack. Uh, 9-11. And, uh, you know, it's hard to go back and recapture what the environment was, but I know in the intelligence community, because I had just rejoined it two days after 9-11, we were in a kind of a frenzy because, for one, we weren't sure whether we were to expect more attacks of the magnitude of, of the ones that occurred on 9-11. So that was point one. So there was a lot of angst, and we knew we were under the gun anyway. We we're going to be investigated, which we were. And of course, the, the Congress got caught up in this as well. So, PAC passed the USA Freedom Act, which, in the minds of some people, is profoundly infringed on, on civil rights and privacy in this in this country. And one of the provisions of the USA Freedom Act, Section 215, which is what governed the limited business records telephony metadata uh, program, where this was stored by NSA. Now, what? So the reason this was put in place and the reason why people thought it was necessary was to address specifically the situation that prevailed where we had communicants in foreign countries talking to people in this country plotting the attack. And at the time, there was no way to, to connect the dots, which a phrase I wish was excised from the English language because I heard it so much. But that's the reason the law was passed. And it was very, the mistake, of course, was it was very, very secret. This was mandated by the White House, and it be kept very secret. That was a lesson learned for me uh, with, with the Snowden revelations. We should have been more transparent about it. What is metadata? Well, it's data about data. And specifically, what was allowed to be stored <coughs> was about 30% of the phone calls in the United States, landline, not, not uh, mobile phones. Phones derived from landline where it would be a two number, a from number, and the length of the call. There was no content and no names. That's all it was. So if there was a phone number reference from a foreign communicant, a terrorist overseas, who was connecting with someone in the United States, that that's, was the legal basis for uh, allowing that connection, for the connection uh, of the dots. Now, I mean, that's been uh, attacked as ultimately not very useful in addition to the arguments about violating civil liberties. Can you, can you say something about the utility of that a, metadata? Let me say a word about civil liberties uh, because this comes up a lot. 
uh, I do a lot of college and universities, and students raise this about. Um, well, one way to look at this, and again, you have to consider my background and spent 50 years in intelligence, is I asked the kids, uh, so do you stop at stop signs and red lights? Yeah. Do you go to airports two hours early so you can go through TSA in order to get, catch your flight? Do you get driver's licenses? If you're carded at a bar, you, you produce your, your driver's license or identity, what your age is? Then I'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, all of those acts are infringements on their civil liberties and privacy. <laughs> but we do it because, you know, we recognize it's for the common good. So I think there's a certain amount of this with the very limited business records telepathy metadata storage program, which was well intended, was thought to be used not in and of itself, but as part of a, a, a series of tools, you know, arrows in the quiver, so to speak. So I, I get the argument about civil liberties and privacy. I like my civil liberties and privacy too. You know, even intelligence people uh, like that as well. But I do think there's there's a philosophical argument here about you know, civil liberties and privacy on one hand and safety and security of the country on the other. And it can't be one or the other. There's got to be a balance between the two. Now, the mistake that was made, biggest mistake in my mind, was Section 215, which is the most controversial, emotional, shocking revelation of Snowden, was the fact that we were doing it. I would argue that if we had been transparent, if the government at the time had been transparent about the program and explained the need for it, what we thought was the need for it at the time, I don't think people would get any more hinky about it than the fact that the FBI maintains millions of fingerprints on innocent Americans. But nobody gets excited about that because we all know about it and understood and understand why we had the program. And if you think about it, fingerprints are a lot more biometrically intrusive than the limited metadata storage program was. Well, and another thing, if you compare the 215 uh, program to the infamous 702 program. Well, 702, excuse me, Claire, is not infamous. 702 is vital to the safety well, and security of this country. And I'll, let me explain yeah. the difficulty here. I often find myself longing for the halcyon days of the Cold War. You know, the Russian, the Soviet Union and us, very simple. We understood them, they understood us. We could predict what they were going to do. Their military behavior was cyclical, stereotypical. And importantly, there were two, basically, two mutually exclusive intel uh, uh, international telecommunication systems, one dominated by the Soviet Union and its orb, and one dominated in the West by the, by the United States. You hardly ever, ever saw a reference to US persons in the Soviet-dominated telecommunication system. Then we get the internet. Everything's all mixed up. So now you have hundreds of millions of people every day conducting billions of innocent transactions, but all mixed in among them are nefarious people conducting nefarious actions. And it's up to intelligence and law enforcement in this country to sort them out, you know, to find those nefarious needles in not just one haystack, but thousands of haystacks without infringing on anyone's civil liberties and privacy. And, to use a metaphor that Jim Comey once used, we're, the intelligence law enforcement communities are supposed to anticipate when one of those straws of hair, of hay, in one of those thousands of haystacks is about to change into a needle, a nefarious needle, if I can stress the metaphor. So, but if the intelligence community and the law enforcement is deprived of that capability in 702, that will profoundly endanger the safety and security of this country, I assure you. Now, what I was going to ask you, though, is, is 702, I think, has, has proven its usefulness uh, over time, as you say. But if, 702? If, uh, 702 has, uh -oh. no? 215, maybe, but not 702. Has, has not proven its usefulness? Hmm? It has proven its usefulness. So, absolutely. That's what I said. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So what I was going to say, though, is, is Americans got so upset about the uh, By the way, just so you program. understand, mm -hmm. Section 702 of the Foreign I'm sorry for the interruptions yeah. here, but the Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act governs the collection on non-U.S. persons right. overseas. That's what I was about to say. The difference. The problem is those non-U.S. persons overseas are communicating in the Internet 
with Which Americans. Which is all mixed up with innocent people to include innocent people in this country. Right. Right. So what I was going to say was that is substantive uh, intelligence as opposed to metadata. Why did Americans get so upset about 215 and, and not well, object think, to the more substantive? I think part of it was, uh, again, you may disagree with this, but I think part of it was uh, media hysteria. And I thought NSA and the employees of NSA took a lot of unfair hits because all these cartoons about, you know, surveilling you know, as though we're listening, U.S. intelligence community is listening to everybody's phone calls and reading everybody's emails, which is impossible. And NSA doesn't hire Russian linguists and Chinese linguists and Urdu speakers, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, to listen to Americans. So the whole, the whole accusation there, and, and NSA will you know, be forever tainted uh, because of that program, which was mandated to, to them, and it's, it's really incredible. The big lesson, had there been transparency at the time, mm -hmm. explained to the public and to the Congress, here's why we think we need this program, I think it would have been much different. Now let's talk for a minute about Snowden, because as you say, that's where the revelation came from. Had the revelation of the metadata program come voluntarily from uh, the government, it might have been received very differently, but it was partly the drama around the Snowden revelations. Yeah. Um, did you, before Snowden went public with his information and accusations, were you aware uh, that this was going to break? Oh, no, no. We didn't Not know. at all. We didn't know until uh, he showed up. No, uh, you know, I mean, he got onto things because he, he was missing, but he, he covered his, a, his actions, his departure. Uh, he was uh, assigned at the time to a uh, big NSA operation in Hawaii. And so he made his way to Hong Kong and thence and then to mainland China. No, 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 we didn't know that. How long do you think? I mean, I think if we had, we might have prevented him from doing it. Yeah, how, how long do you think this was in the planning for him and, and what went into his how thinking? Long how long do you think these, uh, this was in the planning for, for Snowden? And well, he started per warning, uh, we went after the fact, forensically reconstructed his uh, electronic behavior, and he'd been doing per warning secrets for eight or nine months before he left. So, and what do you think his motivations were? That Americans have debated that for he, a long time. He was a narcissist. He uh, had... He had a much, and still does, a much inflated view of himself, and he thought he should be a senior executive and wasn't. And I think it had more to do with, uh, I'll show you, you know, I'll get even with you. You know, the question I always get sometimes, uh, college students think, well, you know, he's a hero. Right. You know, I could almost understand what he did if, if what, all he had exposed was domestic surveillance. But the problem is he exposed so much else that had absolutely nothing to do with foreign intelligence. Mm -hmm. So if you're an American taxpayer, and I suspect most of you in this room are, you're going to be paying to repair the damage that Snowden did mm -hmm. for years to come. Mm -hmm. He profoundly damaged our foreign intelligence collection capabilities. I'll give you a specific example, which I inadvertently declassified on the spot mm -hmm. at a hearing in, on the Hill. We had a program called, it was, it's called Lawful Intercept Program in Afghanistan. And this is where we had a cooperative arrangement with the Afghan Minister of Interior to collect cell phone calls uh, in Afghanistan. And this was the, at the time, the single most important source of warning for IED attacks against our troops. Glenn Greenwald, an accomplice, a journalist accomplice of uh, Edward Snowden, published an article about this program in The Guardian, the very next day, President Karzai shut it down, thus depriving us of the single most important source of warning on the IED attacks on our troops. That's just one example of the profound damage that Edward Snowden did. I could, you know, I watched uh, John Oliver, British comedian, interview Snowden, which I think Snowden probably anticipated was going to be a comedic experience. And Oliver skewered him. And one of the questions he asked him, did you read the documents that you stole? And Snowden said no. Okay. You had a, a 
very um, difficult exchange with Senator Wyden and testifying yeah. before Congress. And in fact, Snowden um, said that listening to that exchange uh, was one thing that tipped him over the edge. Well, that was BS because he'd already started stealing That's stuff. That's what way I'm before, wondering. Way yeah. before. That, that happened on March 13th. And Senator Wyden asked a question about. Uh, what you never see on the YouTube video, by the way, that gets repeated over and over again, is the uh, meandering, euphemistic preface to his question, in which he referred, used the term dossiers twice. Then, you know, different a different meaning now, but in, this is 2013. It would uh, be seven years ago uh, next month. So this question was posed by Senator Wyden at the end of a two-and-a-half-hour worldwide threat hearing. Uh, and he asked me this question, and I simply didn't think about what he was asking about. What he was asking about was the aforementioned Section 215, although he never mentioned Section 215, never mentioned metadata or any of that. He asked the question in a very euphemistic way. I didn't catch on what he was thinking about. I thought about Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance right. Act, which we had just spent months getting renewed at the end of 2012. So... And moreover, uh, so I, of course the the the, uh, the image was that I had lied to him and to the American people, which is baloney. I made a big mistake, which I've acknowledged in writing and public and everything else. I made a big mistake, but I didn't lie. There's a big difference. And oh, by the way, I test I had testified maybe 25 years over a period of 25 years in various intelligence capacities. I probably answered hundreds, maybe thousands of questions, counting the ones I had to answer in writing, either in open or closed sessions. And I always endeavored to try to be as truthful and straight as I could. But gee, just for a change of pace, I think I'll lie on this one question. And by the way, do it on live television in front of one of my oversight committees. Really? No. So Wyden is yet today, revels in his little narrative about how I lied to the American people. He also claims he sent the question over early. He may have. I never saw it. My staff may have decided it was completely irrelevant to the subject of the hearing. So, you know, I made a big mistake. Um, and I also challenge people when they accuse me of lying is that unless they're mind readers, there's only one person on the planet who knew my state of mind and what I was thinking when Wyden asked me that question, and that's me, nobody else. Well, actually, and our... Perjury our, uh, and all that requires a willful intent to deceive, and there, there was not a willful intent to deceive. But all to say, uh, Edward Snowden gave me a lot of heartburn. To back you up there, um, Director Clapper, I had a conversation with our board member, Sean Turner, who was working for you at the time, and who in the uh, testimony you can see sitting behind you, and he said that he knew your state of mind at the time, and he said, darn, he misunderstood the question. So uh, that well, was his my, take listening to you. My explanation is that I just didn't think about what he asked me about, that's all. So now, uh, perhaps from the sublime to the ridiculous, we can talk about the current administration and, and the attacks on the, on the yeah, even intelligence. If had, even if I had lied, well, once every seven years is not bad. <laughs> Compared to 16,000 times in the last, you know. So let's talk about the, the recent attacks on the intelligence community, um, which have been um, intensifying and uh, really have caused an enormous rift between uh, current and past members of the intelligence community and this administration. Um, how is the current atmosphere uh, around intelligence um, what kind of impact is that having on, uh, on the intelligence community and their ability to, to do their job? Well, I think, first of all, this is a FAQ, frequently asked question. What's the morale of the intelligence community? Well, that's hard to answer unless, you know, I don't have benefit of a climate survey that we always used to run every year across the intelligence community, so I, I, don't, I don't have access to that anymore. But I will tell you that a lot of the political fall to all in Washington doesn't affect directly the daily lives of most people in the intelligence business. If you're an embassy ex someplace as a case officer, you're just got your head down doing your mission. Or if you're an NSA Hawaii or NSA Colorado or wherever, if you're overseas, 
it just doesn't affect you. Uh, even in Washington, uh, the, some of the agencies, one, my old agency, NGA, who's a technical agency, does technical stuff, is really not affected by all the politics. Now, some components, though, are disproportionately affected. Notably, my old staff, Office of Director of National Intelligence, and parts of the CIA are affected. The, the element of the intelligence community that most concerns me, however, is the FBI because of the steady assaults right. on uh, the FBI. And she yeah, it's made mistakes, like all human organizations. Humans make mistakes. The FBI is a superb organization. 36,000 men and women all over the world uh, keeping it safe and secure every day. And they've taken a, a, a lot of uh, bad hits. So, so let's come to the, to the recent. We're going to go back in, in just a minute um, uh, to events in between. But, but let's talk for a minute about the recent Inspector General's report, um, which found um, sort of a little of this and a little of that, some, something for both sides. Um, uh, it found that mistakes were made, but it also found that the very controversial um, uh, FISA warrant on Carter Page was well predicated. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that, and, and why has this become such a lightning rod? Indeed, why is the Trump administration, instead of uh, separating themselves from well, Carter Page, have, have tried to defend him? Uh, I mean, the... The psychology of the Trump campaign uh, was great suspicion about intelligence and law enforcement, and that you know, ergo the deep state business, which it's a that's a, a term of art, a term I never heard of before. So a lot of suspicion, I think, inherently uh, of intelligence and. Uh, Law enforcement and, and the claim uh, that the, the campaign was spied on, right? I'm sorry? And the claim that the the campaign was spied on, which is a, a oh, yeah. off repeated um, claim that is we, convincing we accused, a lot of Americans. We were accused of surveilling Trump Tower, you know, right. tapping, wiretapping Trump Tower, which is ridiculous. Uh, there was no there was no wiretap of Trump Tower. Um, I will tell you that in in the period where uh, you know after. Uh, in the run-up to the election and immediately after and during the transition, we in the Obama administration were just concerned about why all these meetings with Russians. We didn't know the content, the discussion. That all came out later. We didn't know about the June 16 meeting and about the email, you know, Hillary Clinton's emails. We didn't know anything about that contemporaneously. But we were concerned about why all these dozens of meetings with Russians. Right. Uh, so it made us made me wonder, and others, about the violation of the principle of one president and one administration at a time. And why the Russians, of all people, are adversaries? The Russians are not our friends, notably Vladimir Putin. Uh, so there's a lot of concern. So the suspicion about surveilling Trump Tower, of course, the president is very prone to accept conspiracy theories that he, that he reads on the internet. And so, you know, we were kind of uh, guilty uh, from from the get-go. And of course, the intelligence community assessment that we did at the direction of President Obama on the Russian interference in 2016, uh, the, the evidence, the intelligence evidence was incontrovertible that it was the Russians. And they did favor one candidate. They wanted to help one candidate hurt the other. And uh, it was overwhelming, the evidence for that. That's why we had such high confidence. Well, President-elect Trump, when we briefed him on January 6th in 2017, in my first last, uh, first and last sojourn ever at Trump Tower, uh, didn't like that because it, it obviously casts doubt on the legitimacy of his election. So he's never been able to accept that. He's never, in all his thousands of tweets, you won't find one where he dimes out Putin or the Russians for interfering in our election. Now, when you... when you. Time put out the announcement that the Russians were interfering in the election. But it's always ambiguous. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the Russians, I hear that. But it could have been the Chinese, could have been the 400-pound guy in his bed in New Jersey. No, or the Ukrainians lately. No, it was none of that. It was the Russians. Right. Now, that was the same day that the Hollywood access tape came out. Well, you're talking right? about one of the debates well, we had. The initial, one, one of the criticisms yeah. of the Obama administration was why 
President Obama didn't more didn't do more earlier. Right. Well, a couple of reasons for that. One, and it's not like we didn't understand that. You know, we had many, many discussions in the White House situation room about what to do about this unprecedented situation. I mean, the Russians have a long history of inter interfering in our elections. We have records going back to at least the, si the 60s. But it was always pretty obvious and ham-handed. Never, never have we encountered the magnitude of what they did in 2016. They reached 132 million Americans on Facebook alone. And they had messages for everybody. Black Lives Matter, white supremacists, pro-Nazi, anti-Nazi, pro-gun control, anti-gun control, whatever group they thought they could exploit. And we're unfortunately a ripe target for the polarization and divisiveness in this country. And the Russians understood that, understand it. They did it in 16, they're gonna do it again in 2020. And unfortunately, others are gonna to go to school on what they did in, 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 in 2020. Where was I? I got lost. Where were we? Well, so talking about the, the, um, the dilution of the message to the American population oh. that the Russians were hacking our election. Yeah. Was that, was that release of that access Hollywood tape well, a deliberate anyway, no, distraction I, in your view? So what the issue was, one of the issues, the other reason uh, we didn't, uh, one, uh, one of the concerns was we, if we, if we make a big deal out of this, if President Obama went on primetime television and laid all this out, would we be amplifying, dignifying what the, what right. the Russians were doing? And the other reason, I think, uh, and there's nothing I heard him say, but I'm, I'm just in, inferring from what I saw, the other thing was he didn't want to be seen as putting his hand on the scale in favor of one candidate and the disfavor of the other against the backdrop of the accusations that Trump was making that right. the, if he didn't win, the election was rigged. And President Obama was very reluctant to play to that narrative. So we had a lot of arguments about saying something. I was a proponent for being public. So finally, it was agreed in the interagency that Jay Johnson, who was then the Secretary of Homeland Security, and I would go out with a joint statement laying out what, was going, what the Russians were doing. So unfortunately, by the time we got it staffed and agreed upon it by the interagency, we put it out on the 7th of October of 2016, month before the election. And it, you know, it dimed out Putin. Unfortunately, that's the same day the Access Hollywood tape business came out. And also the John Podesta hacked emails came out all on the same day. So our big message about the, the threat posed by the Russians got completely emasculated by the coincidence of these other two events. Now, I've heard the theory that the Russians were actually behind the release of the Hollywood Access tape in order to distract from your announcement. Do you well, put I don't stock know. in that? Could, possible, I suppose. I don't know. So let me, I want to turn to our audience, but, but my last question before we do that is to ask you to um, opine on the potential causal impact of, of Russian interference in the election, in the 2016 election and the potential for a repeat of that. <clears throat> you make quite a strong claim in the book, in the book which yeah. is... Well, undoubtedly, <clears throat> most, first of all, I need to make it clear that in the intelligence community assessment that we did, we did not make any judgment about whether the Russians had impact on the election. We didn't have that charter, that's not, right. uh, nor did we have the resources to make that determination. The only thing we said in that assessment was that we saw no evidence of uh, meddling with voter tallies. That's not to say there wasn't meddling, we just didn't see the evidence of it. That's all we said. When we briefed the president and his team, uh, Rance Priebus was there as a putative chief of staff, so but before we left the room, he wanted to write a press statement to say, which included a statement to the effect that we said there was no impact on the outcome of the election, which we did not say. And I respectfully corrected him. Uh, on that on that point, but in my book, I do believe, and this I'll call this an informed belief, that given the magnitude of what the Russians did, uh, their uh, huge the magnitude of what they, particularly in social media, 132 million Americans were messaged by the Russians on Facebook alone. Something else we never talk about is RT, which is their uh, propaganda, funded by the Russian government, which 
I'm sad to say, has better ratings in this country than my own network, CNN. Oh, God. And so they, and plus all the, the hacking they did, and believe me, we have proof of the fact that the uh, hacked emails that went to Julian uh, Assange, WikiLeaks, came from the came Russians. from the Russians, yeah. And there was a cutout, so Assange can publicly deny that what did come from the Russians. Well, of course, came came ultimately from them. Anyway, so it's my belief when you, th you consider that the, the election turned on. 80,000 votes, less than 80,000 votes in three key states, which the Russians targeted, and where there was apparently depressed minority voting, that I believe the Russians turned the election for Trump. Now, this is not an indictment of anybody who voted for Trump. It is an indictment, maybe, on we didn't do enough. We didn't forestall what the Russians did, and we didn't do enough. We weren't aggressive enough about educating the public about what was going on. Do you think we're as vulnerable to Russian interference with regard to the 2020 election as we were in 2016? It's a hard question to answer because um, there's been a lot done, I'm sure, by uh, federal agencies. And of course, our voting apparatus is very decentralized. It's, it's run on a state by state local basis. So I'm quite sure that progress has been made, but it's uneven. The bigger issue, though, and this is why this is an important question, is what we think about in that context is securing, say, voter registration rolls or securing the, the mechanisms for compiling votes and counting votes and reporting votes. What that ignores is that's technical security. There is another class of security I'll call, for the lack of a better term, cognitive security, meaning how do you get people not to believe everything they see, read, and hear on the internet. That is a much more difficult problem. And the Russians know that. And they'll exploit it in 2020. And the problem is, thanks to the, which I agree with, the detail that was included in the two key Mueller indictments uh, in July, in February and July of 18, plus volume one of the Mueller report, which right. goes into very explicit technical detail that shows what the Russians did, which was very revelatory. So you can bet the Russians have gone to school on all that. So they're going to be interfering for sure in 2020, but it's going to be harder to detect. Mm. With that, and by the way, other countries are going to use the Russian playbook in 2020. Because they've shown us how effective it Chinese, can be. North yeah. Koreans, they'll all be in there grinding their own agenda axis. All right, let's let members of our audience in. We have. Uh, Two folks holding microphones there, raise your hand and please introduce yourself uh, when you uh, ask a question. Uh, thank you. Uh, Alan Reich, uh, Law 75. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you for your service, Director Clapper, uh, and say that when you became Director of National Intelligence, you came to that position with a distinguished career in intelligence. And what we're seeing is a systematic dismantling and discrediting of the, uh, of the community, the intelligence community. And somebody in that position now with no intelligence, oh, I should stop there, no intelligence <laughs> experience, um, how concerned should we be that the Russian experts have been purged uh, and the whole system has been manipulated? Can we ever get it back? Well, I hope so. Uh, but you're right to bring it up because it, it's, uh, I'm very concerned about it. And of course, uh, I've been asked about this on television, and I've always said that I believe that the position of DNI should be occupied by a professional, somebody who's a career intelligence officer. I, it was the hardest thing I ever tried to do in my 50 years in intelligence. And I can't imagine what it's like uh, if you're learning the ABCs on, on the job in that, in that position. Well, the current incumbent is not there to master intelligence or to understand intelligence threats or any of that stuff. He's there 
to do a house cleaning and to get control of the intelligence community. It's, it's very clear. So you stick a partisan, which he is, a stalwart partisan, uh, who's, uh, which is often the case in administration where the, the first criterion for appointing somebody is loyalty, not to, the, not to the presidency, but to the president personally, where that's the, that's the first acid test of whether somebody's going to get appointed to that position. Well, that's not good, there, you know, for uh, the sake of what's holy writ in intelligence, which is truth to power. That's what intelligence is supposed to do. Even if the, if the truth, you know, doesn't comport with the current incumbent's worldview. Now, in, in fairness, a policymaker, to include policymaker number one, always has the, the option of ignoring or rejecting uh, the intelligence that, that he or she's given. They always have that option. I would offer, though, that doing that over a, period, a long period of time, over many issues, is dangerous to the safety and security of the country. Now, can it be restored? Yeah, I think it can. Now, if President Trump is reelected, that's, uh, that's a different proposition. I, I, I can't say. Yeah, I, I see we, since 9-11, we spent a lot of time focusing on a foreign effort to do the United States in, whether it was terrorists from uh, Muslim countries. Have we been diverting our attention from somebody or something that may be the real culprit, organized Republican leadership? <laughs> and I'm serious about this. I think our attention's been diverted. I go back to Bush versus Gore and Palm Beach County, I was involved in that. Uh -huh. And I am convinced beyond any doubt that Gore won that election by several thousand votes. And I can go into all the reasons. But again, the Republicans on the US Supreme Court prevented that, if you recall. Now we go to the present situation and where our attention is focused on Russia, Russia. And Russia's saying it's the Ukraine. Uh, the point I'm making is maybe we need to focus the attention on the real culprits, the leadership of a good part of our republic, organized Republican Party. And I suggest to you that we should direct our intelligence agencies to the extent possible, and it may be too late to do something to do that. Because well, I think we'll find the real culprits. You know, uh, we spent a lot of time uh, <laughs> spent a lot of time talking about um, Section 215 and the metadata program because of its uh, intrusiveness, spying on Americans, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so I think the, the reaction to that, uh, you know, I, I might agree with you over a beer, but the reaction to that in, institutionally would be great reticence to you know, spy even more on uh, American citizens. This is one of the reasons why the policy, I, by the way, the policy I followed with both Bob Mueller when he was director and then Jim Comey with the FBI was, I left it entirely up to them whether, what, and when to tell me about any counterintelligence investigation involving U.S. persons, just because of that sensitivity about uh, spying on, on U.S. citizens. I was a young pup in the intelligence community Back in the 70s, when we had the Church Pike hearings, I was at NSA then. And the, there were abuses, no question about it, about the, uh, and the U.S. intelligence apparatus, foreign intelligence apparatus, was kind of used just that way because this was Vietnam, my war. And there was what many feared was a, an insurrection uh, in this country about Vietnam. I mean, there was burning cities and all this sort of thing. People got exercised about that, got very concerned about it. So the foreign intelligence apparatus, yeah. to include NSA, was used to spy on American citizens. And the result was big expose, big open hearings, and that is what led to the establishment of the two intelligence oversight committees in each house of the mm -hmm. Congress. Mm -hmm. The HIPSI in the 76, I think, and the SSCI a year later. The one uh, 
point that. So if we uh, did that, if we did it, it, it if the intelligence no, we the intelligence community did as you suggested, you can bet at some point lot. there'll be another big investigation about but, abusing the capabilities of the intelligence community for domestic spying. But Steve, another answer to you, of course, is that focusing on the Russians has taught us a lot about ourselves. Since they have exposed so many problems in American society, one of the things that they did, which you described very eloquently, is engage in voter suppression, um, with particular focus on suppressing the vote of African Americans. Right, and so so we learn that from seeing what the Russians are doing. You know, the they Russians, understand what they did us better than we do. What they did was yeah. very skillfully, and they targeted African Americans by telling them it wasn't worth their time. Basically, the message was, they didn't say it this way, it's it's a waste of time to vote. So. We have someone up here with a question. Hi, Dr. Clapper. Uh, my name is Kevin Harmer. My question is, what is your intake on us and North Korea, and what would be your advice to the next director of national intelligence? I didn't hear the second Nor question. What is your advice on, on North Korea? Oh, and what North is Korea, your, yeah. yeah. Thank you well, for that question. Well, I'll tell you, my thinking about North Korea, I served in, in South Korea in the early 80s as director of intelligence for U.S. Forces Korea. So I, I sort of became an amateur student of the, of the peninsula. So fast forward to November 2014, and I was sent to Pyongyang to bring in out two of our Americans, that, uh, two American citizens under hard labor conditions. And it was quite an experience for me. Uh, everything you've ever read about what a bizarre place North Korea is, it's all true. It is bizarre. And I had an occasion to engage with two senior North Koreans, one of whom was Kim Jong-chul, who was the love letter deliverer to the uh, Oval Office. At the time, he was a military four-star and a, the head of their, what they call RGB, the Reconnaissance General Bureau, which is their version of the Soviet GRU. Not to be confused he, with Ruth Bader Ginsburg. He hated Americans, hated me. He'd been told to, uh, to host me, but he hated it. One thing I was struck with was the uh, overwhelming paranoia and siege mentality that, that exists in North Korea and Pyongyang. So... My first White House issued talking point that I was instructed to recite to the North Koreans was, you must denuclearize before we'll talk to you. Well, I was there about five minutes and I concluded that that was a lost cause because the North Koreans are not going to denuclearize. Not in our lifetimes, they ain't gonna happen. Why should they? That's their, they recognize that's their ticket to survival. They understand their weaknesses. They understand the military, conventional military imbalance between South Korea, buttressed by the U.S. forces, and their own conventional forces. They understand the weaknesses of their economy. They understand all that. And they understand that no one would pay any attention in North Korea if it weren't for their nuclear weapons, or more accurately, the perception of nuclear weapons. Because I would, I would offer that I don't think either, neither they nor we know if they'll work but it doesn't matter because they've achieved what they want, which is nuclear deterrence, which is all about psychology anyway. Something I learned during my nine months at SAC. So I've come to believe we might want to think about uh, just de jure what is already de facto, which is the fact is the North Koreans, like it or not, are part of the nuclear club. That's what they want to be recognized. Then induce them to behave responsibly. You want to be uh, recognized as a member of the nuclear club, then you need to behave like it. Now, a lot of people don't like the fact that the likes of India and Pakistan have nuclear weapons. But the fact is, they do. And the fact is, they've been responsible with them. So maybe that might be a, a, a more profitable uh, mm. approach. Now, I was a supporter and I said so on CNN, of President Trump meeting with Kim Jong-un. I thought that was a good idea. And the reason is, it struck me that the North Koreans were stuck on their narrative, and we're stuck on our narrative. You must denuclearize. And the only way that narrative can be changed is if the bigger partner changes it, the bigger partner being the United States. The problem is, Trump squandered the, the tremendous leverage he had the first time he met with Kim Jong-un. Because the Kim family, historically, 
Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il, and Kim Jong-un lusted for a direct personal meeting with the President of the United States. Mm -hmm. That was a huge deal to them and a huge concession on our part, and we should have taken better advantage of it. Mm -hmm. So if, by the way, if North Korea is ever going to be induced to denuclearize, it will start in Seoul, mm -hmm. not in Washington. Mm -hmm. And the only way, if the South Koreans can persuade the North Koreans that no, we're not going to invade you, no, we're not going to overturn the regime, over time, a long time, the North Koreans might be persuaded to denuclearize. The other player here, this big player, is China. And people forget that. But, you know, if the reason the sanctions don't work so well is because the Chinese are kind of uneven about enforcing, I'll, I'll be charitable. And, the, and the, the, the imperative here for the Chinese, they do not want implosion of North Korea because they lose their buffer. The North Korean, the Chinese cannot, and I've talked to them about this, they cannot tolerate having the presence of South Korean forces buttressed by the United States on the Yellow River. That is unthinkable mm -hmm. to them. So they'll, you know, put the screws to North Korea to a point, but not so much that, that the, the regime would collapse. Let's take two questions at a time, if we may. We have a gentleman here and then over here. Um, excuse me. And uh, Director Clapper, I read recently answer. that Senator Lindsey Graham said that the office of DNI is redundant. I, I assume you disagree with him, but I do. why would someone like Senator Graham say something like that? Now, hang on. We'll take one more question before you answer so we can get well, to I can't to remember two time. questions. Then. I'm I'll wondering whether any useful intelligence was obtained from the wire tapping under Section 215. Okay. So first, Lindsey Graham's. Okay. Remark. Well, uh, no, I don't agree with him at all. And I said so on the air, uh, apart, apart from what the law says, there's a law that says you'll have a DNI. So just put that aside for the moment, is the, what I believe is the necessity for having a DNI who, who, can, who spends time do, working on intelligence issues. There needs to be a full-time champion advocate for integration, coordination, collaboration across the intelligence community. That is not a natural act that will just happen all by itself. Bureaucracies, whether it's intelligence or not, are, are prone to, to cloistering themselves, you know, especially in intelligence. We're, you know, extroverts in intelligence are people that look at other people's shoes. You know, so you've got to have that, that champion for that whose full-time job is promoting integration. Now, the I, think second be, I think it'd be a big mistake I think uh, it would endanger the country. Now, this assumes that <laughs> the DNI is nominally doing what the law intended for him or her to do. And the other question was on 215. Yeah, did we get any useful intelligence out well, of the 215 program? We, I'll tell you, in the defense of it, we collectively, I was part of this, oversold it uh, afterwards. And uh, the problem was trying to justify 215 in a vacuum. Because it's, it was intended to be used as a suite of tools, you know, in conjunction with, particularly with 702. And so trying to single out, well, what were the contributions of, there were some, but not, I don't think, to the, you know, with, with, with the price we paid for it and the fall to all and controversy it caused in this country. So personally, I'd be for taking the risk and doing away with it. We're, uh, we're going to have to close, I think. I know there's still people with questions, uh, and I apologize for not getting to you. Uh, Director Clapper will be staying with us through a reception uh, and book signing, so I hope that, that you'll all um, join us for that. Um, just before we end, I wanted to, to close by reading the last paragraph of your book and, and, and just inviting you to, to make some comments uh, about the future. You write... It is at this point impossible to know whether we will restore our balance and national conscience. We have a reassuring history of recovery from similar, similar national traumas, most prominently the Civil War and the Vietnam War. 
Our institutions were battered and our national fabric severely stressed to the breaking point, but we recovered from both and over time emerged the better for it. Do you think that's going to happen here? Well, uh, you know, the only argument I had with my collaborator, the whole, it took a, a year to write the book, the only argument we had on the whole book was how to end it. <laughs> so we wrote a very dark projection of what was going to happen in this country. And then we wrote a happy face version. <laughs> and we didn't like either one. <laughs> so we ended up with kind of a my managing editor at the publisher Viking got involved and was very helpful and we sort of sort of drew went down the middle by citing the civil war you know we've 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 survived traumas in the past no notably the civil war and what I lived through my war Vietnam and in the end we emerged the the stronger and the better for it now I I honestly can't say and we didn't really whether that's going to happen again. I hope it does, but I, I honestly don't know. On that ambiguous note, <laughs> please join me in thanking Director Clapper. Thank you.